Um, thank you for staying around until the end. Um, since I'm the last speaker and we had some wonderful uh, but quite technical talk before me, um, I thought I would, uh, you know, wax poetic and then show you some pictures so that you don't have to really work too hard for this talk. Um, so I thought I would change my title a little bit to the reasons to love GANs because this is really like a, a love fest to, to Ian and, 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 and the, the wonderful uh, work that he has done. Um, but before that, of course, you know, have to have some disclaimers. What are the reasons to, to dislike GANs? And I think some have just been mentioned. Um, they are a devil to train and you know some of the issues people have already mentioned you know the, the discriminator nearly always wins uh, sometimes take uh, uh, training uh, longer it makes it worse very annoying sometimes more data doesn't make it better which is I don't understand how quite it is how it is um, and but I really hope that these things would be nailed uh, one way or the other so please keep working um, do they really generate a distribution some of you machine learning people might have a heart attack. Oh no, it's not a real distribution. You know, for me, we don't care. We just want uh, something to work. You know, in computer graphics, you just need one good picture. You don't need the whole distribution. You just need one good one. You know. So for that, GANs have been have been really working very well. And you know, there is the gener generality penalty for any given problem. It's often you know one can often find a, a kind of special tailored solution that would work better. So if you, you know, if you have like some problem that you want to solve, I would say, you know, try something kind of direct and straightforward uh, uh, first. Uh, but if you are kind of more interested in this, in this direction, I think then you should st stick around. So here are my three reasons to love GANs. They set up a, an arms race. They can be uh, thought of as learn loss functions and they could be used in meta supervision and I'll very briefly go over this. So the first point is really very, uh, <laughs> uh, very philosophical. Um, but st at least for me, I, that's what really got me excited about GANs. The fact that they are really, you know, an adversarial algorithm uh, that sets up an, arm, uh, an arms race and it, it seems to be working unlike many of the others. So what do I mean by arms races? Um, this, you know, brings me back to uh, I was, uh, I grew up in the Soviet Union in the 80s and, you know, we didn't have much food. We had to go to the store and there would be either nothing or you were standing in a long line, three hours to get toilet paper. And then in the late 80s, I moved to the United States and it was a shock. You go to the supermarket and there's all this stuff, you know, as much toilet paper as you heart would want. And this was a really hard for me to take as a Russian because it's like, you know, we Russians, we're not like super stupid, right? You know, we have great physicists, great mathematicians, uh, you know, Tch Tchaikovsky, you know, artists, uh, writers, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. You know, why couldn't we figure out the toilet paper? So, <laughs> so you know, I, I, I read up on this and, and you know, the, the one issue that was that, you know, we had the planet economy, we had this, what's called the five-year plan, so every five years, uh, you know, the economists would get together and figure out, you know, a fixed objective that the whole country would, you know, how much of everything will be produced in the, within the next five years. So it was all fixed and then boom, 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 you know, they would do, they would do it. And, and that is, turns out to be a problem. And to show you, here is an example of uh, 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 pocket calculators. So this is a famous HP, HP 80 pocket calculator circa 1973. And this is the corresponding Soviet version. Um, we say that, you know, Soviet pocket calculators are the largest pocket calculators in the world. Um, but, you know, why, why did this happen? And one reason uh, is very likely that what happened was that in the beginning calculators didn't, you didn't really care about calculators being small. You just needed them to compute stuff. But HP was under pressure to make it cheaper, you know, and so other, so they would say, okay, how do we make it cheaper? Well, if we use less stuff, less material, it will be cheaper. And so they made it a little bit smaller and then other companies made it a little bit smaller and then boom, 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 and arms race developed. And then at some point they were s almost small enough that people would look at it and say, oh, wait a minute, we could put it in your pocket. It, it, so uh, basically, this arms race caused an emergent property that, 
in the Soviet economy, you never had to worry about that because that was not the original plan five years ago to make it small, right? And it, it, nothing really emerged. And so to me, as somebody who kind of suffered through the, through the planned economy, um, I thought that this uh, 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 property of, 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 of GANs as, as, you know, as an example of, a, of an adversarial uh, algorithm was very exciting. And, and of course, there could be other adversarial algorithms out there, but I, I think so far the GANs are really the only thing that, that can really, we can say, is working. So I think this to me was kind of a philosophically a very exciting thing. So related to this is, is the idea that GANs, at least conditional GANs, you can think of them as learning a loss function. So what do I mean by that? Um, so, you know, if you want to do some sort of an image to image translation problem, for example, you want to go from grayscale image to color image or from uh, low res to, to high res, um, you know, you can set up a, a network to train it with some loss function. You know, you can use L2 regression, that's what the statisticians would tell you to try it first. And you notice that it just doesn't work very well, right? Because something like L2 or even L1, basically it would average different modes of your solution. So, you know, the bird could be red or the bird could be blue, and then L2 will basically say, well, I'm gonna go make both of you guys happy, so it's gonna be gray, just so it's, you know, equal distance from all the right solutions. But that's not what you want. The same thing for super resolution is we'll just blur things together, right? Because it's gonna try to find basically to something that in the middle that makes all the modes happy, even though that's a very low probability of this. So, you know, what do you do? You get a very, very smart Berkeley graduate student or a very, very, very smart uh, Stanford graduate student, and they hack and hack and hack until they come up with some nice loss function that works very well for this project, pro 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 uh, 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 project, but then doesn't really translate to something else. So, you know, we came up with this uh, cross entropy loss with some colorization term. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the super resolution people use the, 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 the feature loss. But then, you know, you couldn't, they are, they're not interchangeable. They're really tailored to the program. Um, but it would be really nice to have some sort of a universal loss for these kind of image to image translation problems. You know, basically something to tell you if your image is good enough or not. And we know one such universal loss. That's called graduate student descent, right? At least, you know, in, in computer graphics, at least, you know, basically the graduate student works and works and works until it's look good enough to publish, right? So that's basically what we want, but of course it's kind of hard to, you know, backprop graduate students. Um, so, you know, what, what we do for evaluation at least is we take those results and then we compare it to, you know, real, real photographs, right? And then we send it on Turk and then we can compare, okay, is this, is this colorized, colorized image uh, look, can be, uh, can be mistaken for a real color photograph, yes or no? And that's, that's what we report in our papers, right? And actually, you, so that you can think of, of the GANs is basically doing that, but instead of having it done by the Turker, right, you do it in the, by the, by the, gener by the discriminator, and then you can, you can backprop the, for the whole thing. So in a sense, if you think about it from the point of view of a computer graphics researcher, GANs, have exactly the right loss function for doing computer graphics. They are exactly doing what, what computer graphics is trying to do, right? You want to generate samples that are indistinguishable by, you know, your movie audience from, from the real thing. And, and, and so that, that's what uh, got us very excited. Um, you can, you know, this is kind of the standard, you know, generator discriminator. Of course, we were using the conditional uh, version of this so because we want to do translation from one to the other. And, you know, the standard, the standard story. I think one thing that is nice and, you know, uh, Phil, Phil Isola likes to point this out is that from the point of view of the generator, you can think of the whole discriminator, that whole thing is basically just like a loss function, right? It's not quite a loss function, but you can think of it as a loss function, except that instead of like L1 or L2, it's a learned loss function, right? So basically what, what this thing is doing for you, it's giving you a learn function for your particular task, tailor-made. And the nice thing is that this 
loss function is 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 actually you know it has some emergent properties you know just whereas you know l1 or l2 it really looked at every pixel independently it doesn't really look at things the interaction between pixels this thing if it needs to it will it will encode these you know struct it could be a structured loss if it needs to it can do very sophisticated things kind of on its own and it's kind of a very neat uh, a trick that that you can basically, you know, just for a given input output uh, domains, you get your own tailor-made loss function basically for free. And, and so that's one way to, to think about kind of a, why we were getting these kind of cool results uh, uh, on stuff that Junian just talked about uh, earlier um, without really changing anything in the algorithm. It's exactly the same algorithm, even exactly the same parameters. So the magic is in this, in, in GANs basically getting you, thinking, figuring out for every domain pair, figuring out the loss that would, you know, do something reasonable. And again, you know, for any one of these examples, you could sit down and come up with something tailor-made that could work as well or even better. Uh, for example, for colorization, you know, our other results are better. But really, nothing really seems to work as good on just all of the things altogether. And this is, this is I think, very exciting. Um, so the third point is uh, GANs for, for meta supervision. So what do I even mean by meta supervision? So um, kind of motivation here is that for picks to picks, you have to have paired data. You know, you train your, you have to pair your, your, your sketches to your, to your shoes, for example, and then you, can, then you can generate things, right? But what if you don't have the paired data? So for example, if you have, you know, a, a set of, say, horses and a set of zebras, right? Or, or a set of, you know, photographs and a set of uh, Cezanne paintings, right? There is no, it's not even clear how do you make the correspondence. It doesn't, it doesn't even make much sense. Um, so if you do that, then the whole kind of standard GAN story doesn't quite work out because in a conditional GAN, you really need to, need to have the kind of the input image. But in, if you don't have, if you don't have a correspondence, then, okay, so you can put a discriminator and say, okay, you know, this is a horse, this is a zebra, you know, this zebra looks good to me, but, you know, so does this zebra, right? This is also real, and the discriminator it would be just perfectly happy with this zebra that has nothing to do with, uh, with the input, right? And so the problem here is that basically we somehow need to get this correspondence between, between the different domains, and this is uh, something that we have actually worked on before. Now, this has nothing to do with GANs, but it's, it, it turns out to be relevant. Um, of basically, for correspondence, we can think of this idea of cycle consistency, where we can composite, composite um, optical flows between sets of images to see if they are consistent with each other, right? So in this particular uh, paper, we we're looking for kind of consistent consistency between different instances of cars. So basically, you can think of it as looking at a consistency of flows going one way and then going another way. And if you if you go there and you come back, you get to the same place, then you're consistent. Uh, and if you don't, you're not consistent. And this has been used in computer vision for a long, long time. You know, tracking you forward track and then you backward track, for example. But you can actually use it for multiple, multiple examples, still the same thing, consistent, not consistent. And, but the cool thing is that the error between where you start and where you end up can then be used as a signal to train your CNN, okay? So this is, and that's why we call it meta supervision, because what you're doing, you're supervising not how the, what the data should be, but how the data should behave the properties of the data. In this case, cycle consistency is a property of the data that you wanted to have. Um, but the problem with just using cycle consistency uh, by itself is, um, you know, it could be consistent but wrong, right? It basically can be, you know, the flows could be all zeros and, and it will be perfectly happy, right? Um, so what we did in that particular paper is we actually went to a, you know, 3D model and then we made some real ground truth correspondences as an anchor to keep it in place and then we, we optimized for the other uh, correspondences. But sometimes you don't have that anchor. What do you do? 
So another place where this cycle consistency is, is being used a lot is in linguistics, in this idea of back translation. Uh, it's often used when you have to translate something very, very important, like this pharmaceutical, you know, documents. So you have, a, so you know, your pharmaceutical document in English, and you want to translate it into French, um, and uh, but you need to make sure that it's exactly the same thing. So you, what you do is you hire another uh, translator, and that person translates it back into English, and then you compare. Um, the results of, of the translation, and that that's why you make sure that it's correct translation, or if it's not, then you kind of update it, you know, uh, and 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 you know, basically figure out until it converges, right? So that's the idea in linguistics. Uh, famously, it, the the work started with Mark Twain, 1903. This is this is a, uh, a paper he wrote. The jumping frog in English, then in French, then clawed back into the civilized language once more by patient unremunerated toil. Um, it's, a, it's a quite an entertaining thing uh, on the failures of, of translation. Uh, but the point here is that even though you, know, you, you do this kind of cycle in, from, from one language to another, how do you know that the other language is actually French? Well, in, in, terms, in, in, in the case of translation, you, know, you could always just evaluate whether the resulting French language is actually correct French, right? Uh, and that's kind of a kind of standard given thing that, that this is supposed to be French. But in our case, this might not be quite the case, right? So this is where we can set up a cycle. We can say, okay, well, if we want to translate in from, from horses to zebras, we should go back to and translate from zebras back to horses and make sure that we get something that looks like a horse, right? But we also need to make sure that when we go there to the zebra land, it actually is a zebra and not some random thing, right? And we, we, and, you know, we want to make sure that the, the G and the F are actually not empty transformations. And so this is where we can use the adversarial loss to force this uh, in, in our translation to force the other domain to be actually the correct domain, okay? And so in this sense, the, the adversarial loss from again can act as another type of a meta supervision. It doesn't tell you what you should be, it just tells you in what domain you should be. In, you know, in, in previous uh, uh, case it was, uh, you should be in the domain of natural images. Here it's in the domain of you know, natural zebras, okay? But, you know, once you're, do, once you're done that, it's actually pretty simple. So our whole thing is, is as follows. You know, we start with our input from, you know, from a horse, then we translate it to the domain of a zebra, and this is our uh, 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 adversarial loss here. And then we train another uh, uh, translator to translate it back into the, um, the, into the horse, and then, the cycle consistency loss is basically just the L, L1 distance between where you start and where you go, and that's what you're optimizing. If you, if you look at this, squint a little bit and look at this from afar, this is basically an autoencoder, but with, with a deep supervision in the middle, and the supervision is from the other domain. But other than that, it's basically kind of a standard thing that we know and love, and we do it from the other direction as well, so that it's, uh, it, it, it's symmetric, okay? And so we have this, this is, this is a work we have in the ICCV, and actually there is another paper that basically came up with a se the same story also here in ICCV. Um, so, you know, we can convert horses into zebras, we can convert zebras into horses, it's the same algorithm, right? And notice that actually, you know, it makes, it, it, it's, it's actually solving an, you know, unsupervised correspondence problem, because it doesn't really, nobody told it what the zebra is, right? So it, it basically solves this, Correspondence and it sometimes it you know it it can also you know change the savanna a little bit make uh, maybe make the the greenery more uh, yellow because of the savanna and this is also why you know some of the some of the failure cases are kind of entertaining right the the horses and zebras never saw never never saw a, a human and so that is the case where the the you know the correspondence algorithm didn't really know what to do so it assumed that uh, Putin here was part of a horse which is not unreasonable given that it's a completely unsupervised problem. Um, 
so then we can do other things like turn oranges into apples and apples into oranges. Uh, uh, my particular favorite is I have all these beautiful pictures of, of, uh, of France and I thought, oh, I can, I can try to make them uh, look more like you know, a Cezanne painting. And indeed, it actually you know, works pretty well. Again, exactly the same algorithm. There is no change in the parameters. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that when we tried this on just random images from Flickr or, or, or ImageNet, the results didn't work very well. Uh, but here, you know, using my pictures that I also took in France, you know, there's maybe something about the domains being not too different. So, you know, it has to be at least, you know, the same country or something like this. The results were much, much better. Um, now, you have seen this kind of results before, all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, style transfer kind of things, neural style transfer. I would claim that our results are, are better. Look, look at this, check out those uh, clouds from uh, the, the Cezanne clouds there. I, I think that they're, they're better than what all of, the, all of these domain uh, 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 style transfer algorithms can do in, because here we are actually looking at the whole collection of all of Cezanne's paintings, not just a particular you know, one painting. So it's able to actually you know, gather more uh, statistics about, about this issue. Uh, what you probably haven't seen before is the fact that we can also go the other way around, go from a painting to something like a photograph. And here I think it's really the, 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 all, the, uh, all the credit goes to Gans that, you know, they're, I think, on the cusp of getting us something, getting us a, a loss function that really can get us to almost realistic images. I mean, these are not quite realistic and, you know, the, the, the input images are Monet and not Cezanne. It would be nice if it was Cezanne both ways, but Cezanne doesn't quite work as well. Monet is closer to, to real realism, so it works better. But I think that's really, really exciting direction, and I'm sure that within a year we'll, we'll, have, we'll have Gans producing, producing really real photorealistic images. Um, here are some more examples from Monet. Uh, you know, y there is definitely some places where you can tell that they are not quite there, but, but I think it's, it's on the right track. Uh, here are some more examples of style transfer, different. And this I just like to show my travel photos. For this is from ECCV last year. Um, so, ah, I have three minutes. So I wanted to sh uh, uh, call my student uh, Taesung here who has some brand new results. They're so off the heart of the press that I wanted him to, to present it. Uh, and then will we still, three minutes. Oh, oh okay, all right. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it's basically the same, uh, same method, like again, trained on different application, you know, different data sets. So what I did is I trained like again on the images taken by iPhone and also the images taken with uh, DSLR. Which, suppo which are supposed to have shallower depth of field. So you can see that the background of the output images are blurred. You know, this is the effect that's uh, simulated using dual camera in the more recent versions of iPhone Plus, which are quite expensive devices. You know what you can do? Instead of buying these devices, you buy a cheaper smartphone and then just build an app using Cyclegan that does this for you, then you can save money or even make money out of it. Uh, I just trained it on uh, summer and winter Yosemite data set. So here we have uh, summer photos of Yosemite. We can transform it to winter photos of Yosemite. Or we can also do it in the reverse direction. Cyclegan is tr training two generators in two different directions. So given real photos of Yosemite, uh, we can change it to summer photos. We also ran it on CG2 real. So uh, given screenshots of GTA, Grand Theft Auto, which has really fantastic rendering of uh, driving. It's basically a CG driving data set. And then we can make it more real realistic using uh, Cyclegan trained on GTA screenshots and also the real images uh, of driving. It can also do it the other way. So given real images of driving, we can make it more computer graphics-y. We actually created a video out of this. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but left side is real and then the right side is fake. Uh, this method, uh, the, the resolution of the image is actually uh, 10, uh, 1024 by 512. So it's pretty large uh, considering the size of GAN. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, 
uh, because cyclegain is fully convolutional, uh, the same architecture can be applied to different resolutions. So this uh, result was trained using 400 by 400 uh, crop patches of the original image. And then at test time, you know, because we don't have to load the discriminator and then we only need to load one generator in one direction, we can actually run it at much higher resolution. We also ran uh, CycleGAN on day to night driving data set. Yes, yeah, we ran this per frame. There's like no smoothing between the frames. So it might be a little bit flickering, but it's amazing that, you know, we didn't do anything to make it uh, look nice on videos and it still looks pretty nice. Uh, CycleGAN got pretty popular online, so lots of people on Twitter have contributed to different applications of CycleGAN. Here I'm showing some results that look interesting. My favorite is bottom left, bear to panda. Uh, let me finish by sharing some implementation details of CycleGAN. So as Junyan uh, talked previously, uh, in pix to pix we compared uh, experimented with encoder decoder like auto encoder architecture and then al we also experimented with unit architecture which has skip connections between layers of the architecture in uh, cycle again we switched over to ResNet. Uh, so the idea is the same the reason that we didn't use encoder decoder and then use unit instead is because we had skip connections that can keep the details of the input image ResNet basically have the same skip connections and also it doesn't have bottleneck uh, in the middle, so you can keep the details of the input architecture. And then the reason that we switched to ResNet instead of UNet is that uh, ResNet has fewer parameters, so it, it works better when the problem is uh, ill caused, like in case of CycleGAN. We don't have ground truth uh, target image given the input image, so having fewer parameters and also making it fully convolutional uh, working on working at the patch level instead of the entire image level uh, makes the tra uh, training m much more stable. Uh, instead of a uh, regular GAN cross entropy uh, loss objective, we used LS GAN least square GAN. The motivation of LS GAN is that the original cross entropy loss has this vanishing gradient problem uh, in the objective function because. The discriminator tends to win a lot, and in that case, we don't get much gradient from the discriminator. Uh, the motivation of LSGAN is that instead of a cross entropy loss, we have quadratic loss, so we ha we don't have this uh, vanishing gradient problem anymore. So what happens is um, every night I start a new experiment, happily go to bed, get some good sleep, and then tomorrow morning I wake up and then get some results that is pretty reasonable. You know, this is an ideal lifestyle of GAN researchers, I think. <laughs> and lastly, uh, another way to uh, look at CycleGAN is combining, like adding as much L1 loss as possible. So in pix to pix we combined L1 loss and also GAN loss uh, for better training. So this L1 loss is a fixed target, so it stabilizes the training of GAN. In CycleGAN, unfortunately, we don't have that uh, correspondence anymore, so we can we couldn't import L1 loss. But another way that is less strong, but something that we can still do is instead of a uh, real horse given fake image of horse, you know, we know the target image. It should be the original uh, zebra image that the inverse generator has translated. So maybe we can go even further, given on uh, input image as the zebra, which is from the target data set, uh, what it should do is, you know, it shouldn't do anything. So given an image of zebra, it should do identity mapping. So I just add that as additional loss, then it seems to help uh, training of CycleGAN. So in some cases, you know, it, like the result kind of changes each time you start, each time you train. But sometimes the CycleGAN uh, result flips the color of the input image. So if you look at the bottom row, uh, this is Monet's painting of sunset, but you can see that you know the sun is gone now. It's all bluish, it looks like it's quite after sunset. So uh, in order to prevent the flip
splitting of color, uh, we added identity loss, and it looks like it's not changing the color so much, and it's doing something more reasonable. Thank you. I'll take questions. to go home. <laughs> uh, um, I think, oh right, so the, the, the question from Samjeev is, of course, you know, what, what are we going to do mathematically? What is, you know, what, if, if it's not a distribution, then, w you know, what, what is the way to think about conditional GANs? Uh, I think the, the issue with conditional GANs are, is, is, is that maybe you can still think of it as kind of a mini distribution, right, given, given what you're conditioning on, right? It's still, it's still a distribution, but it's a, it's a much more manageable one. So, um, you know, maybe when you can, you know, given like, for example, a, a grayscale image, then you're already in the right neighborhood. And so you're basically, your, your distribution is what can you do with that grayscale image as your condition? Maybe it's not that hard. But even then, we, you know, multimodality multi is still a problem. You know, can we generate, you know, m multiple colorization of the same grayscale image? Uh, not, not really. Not, not, not easily. It's still, it's still, you know, there is, there is a bunch of papers coming out, but it's, um, it's, it's not a solved problem. I think, you know, it's as, as long as we have something that can produce, you know, can take whatever, whatever goal you have and project it onto the manifold of natural images. I think that's that's a cool enough, at least for you know for graphics people. That that's that's already a really exciting thing. If in, in there we don't really care about about a distribution. You know how how much of the na the natural image manifold are you? Um, so I think I think that's that's the that's the exciting thing for us. And you know and you know I'm yeah I'm not quite sure it's really um, the the whole the whole um, uh, d you know, generative side of story maybe is not that relevant, at least for some problems. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. So um, I want to ask about the um, phenomenon, I'm over here. <laughs> Hi, um, so I want to ask about the phenomenon about, about like sort of skin turning into zebra. So like you sort of gave the rationale that like, you know, the, you haven't trained on sort of humans so it doesn't really know what to do, but you could also say the same thing about like all, about like you know sort of indoor scenes in general. So I'm sort of wondering if you have any explanation for like you know why the clothes or like the whiteboard in this image aren't turning into zebras as well. Um, is there something special about like skin that might be causing that? Well, we can yeah we can see what well, my feeling yeah so you know why is it focusing on the skin and not on the clothes? It's basically it was trained it was trained on 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 horses in in like in outdoors right, so I suspect that it's basically trying to solve a binary uh, uh, factorization you know are you a horse or are you a background right are you something that is um, zebrable or you're something that's not zebrable, and you know for one reason or another it thought that skin you know leather right it is more like a horse uh, uh, skin than, than other things. Uh, we have seen, I think, in the demos uh, earlier that people with, with some type of clothes have been zebrified, but other type not. So I think it's, a spec, it's basically you know, how close you are to looking like a horse. Do you have any, anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> I think it really depends on uh, which training data set you used because uh, cyclogen the networks are picking up on the biases in the data set. And I think the horse data set that I trained on uh, was from ImageNet. It's category wild horse. So uh, I think it picks up on color a lot because oftentimes the horse is standing on top of grass, which is usually green. So I think there's like a very strong hint just by looking at color and then 
Pokemon face has a similar color as Horse, so I can see why sometimes. <laughs> Alright, thanks. Uh, the question is, do you think GANs can be competitive in a traditional computer vision problem like sig semantic segmentation? Um, we haven't been able to get competitive results with, you know, with pix to pix for example, it can do semantic segmentation, just very simple, just, you know, throw in the, the task that just does something, you know, and it does reasonable things, but it's, it's not competitive to the specially, uh, specially engineered efforts. I think at this point, you know, if, if, if you have a very, you know, if you have a smart grad student and you tell them, write a tailor-made, you know, horse to zebra translator, that would also be better than, than, than cycle gap, right? I think any time you want to do something that's problem specific, you should be able to do better. So I think, you know, for any particular task you're doing, you know, self-driving car or something, the first thing to do is to just try to ha attack the problem directly. I think the power of GANs is the generality, and I think that's the exciting thing. Um, so, so I think, yeah, I, I think that uh, that that's the that's the stuff that's that's going to give you a win. That it's, you know, given a new task, you know, transferring to a new uh, scenario, it it's likely to uh, to do something much more reasonable than whatever your uh, hand handcrafted thing is. Uh, the same way as, you know, uh, semantic segmentation, our, you know, approaches haven't really been able to transfer that well to, to other things, you know, without a lot of hacking. And, and this at least promises to be just very transferable without any parameter tuning at all. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so at the end you talked a little bit about the color sometimes flipping, uh, and so the identity uh, mapping helps that, uh, but there's kind of a more general problem that any like permutation in the other space, there's no constraint preventing that, and the identity kind of helps that, but it doesn't actually enforce that. Do you have thoughts on how you would? Um, so I think we are relying on common sense, in a sense. So we're doing this optimization in GAN training, and then the easiest solution should be the one that's easiest to translate, which is the most reasonable translation to human beings. But sometimes that's not the case, that's why we edit the identity lock or even change the generator architecture. But uh, more or less, we're surprised to see that, you know, even though we have many, many permutations that are possible for CycleGAN to do, it ends up with something quite reasonable. Yeah, I think this is a kind of a, a more fundamental issue that, you know, there is, there is a, way, a lot of ways for this thing to cheat. But somehow, for some reason, it, it cheats much re less often than, than, than we expected. And I think we still don't quite know why this is. It could be just an ar artifact of, you know, the architecture, like the convolutional architectures maybe somehow steer you away from the really uh, nasty solutions. Because really the problem is crazily under constrained, even, even with the, even the cycles, right? The cycles provide a very weak constraint. The, the, the adversarial loss is also, you know, quite a weak constraint. So, the, the fact that it works at all is kind of surprising, and I think there is still a, a question to be, to be figured out why it's working as well as it does. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much. Um,